Welcome to this video. I am uh, filming an introduction at the end of the process, but most of the footage you will see was done as I was figuring out the problems. I wanted to give you a heads up about what the problems were with this machine, because if you were following along with this video, you might look at it and go, hey, I'm having a race issue, so I'm going to test the heads and I'm going to look up the schematic and I'm going to check the erase bias and blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the day, an erase issue that I was having with this 488 is down to the cassette not making proper contact with the magnetic heads. And that's because the case is warped in some way. And there's a certain amount of pressing on the case and tightening of screws and loosening of other screws that you have to do in order to get this to work properly. Um, I also talk about, oh, I think that um, faders are eroded and switches need cleaned and uh, what it's actually turned out to be is that pressure put on these uh, group faders is cracking solder underneath and pressure put on play buttons is cracking the solder underneath so just uh, introducing some uh, fresh solder to those and adjusting the screws holding the two halves of the case and uh, together I mean that would have been if I'd had the power of hindsight or foresight or whatever, then those steps would have fixed the issue. However, the things that I investigated in order to kind of come to that conclusion are probably still interesting. It's probably going to end up being the most detailed video I've done so far in terms of describing how AC bias works to erase tapes and how I check that on these machines. So I think it's about 20 minutes long, this video. So it's quite a lot in there. I hope you get something out of it. Anyway, go ahead and enjoy the video now. I'm in the process of refurbishing this Tascam 488. This is actually the same unit that we saw being cleaned in videos that I published at the time of speaking. God, nearly a year and a half ago. It had been sitting around for a while because the motor was faulty and I replaced the chip in it and it cut out and I was kind of, I suppose, a bit um, overwhelmed with other stuff and scared that I hadn't done the... Uh, motor chip replacement properly but I had it's just that there was one dry joint um, on the black cable going into the motor so I fixed that and the motor's fine so that's allowed me to start testing so first thing I want to show you about this is this is what one of my units looks like after I've tested it what I do is I get green tape and I put it beside every control that I've tested and if there's a problem with it then I leave masking tape by masking tape, I mean this stuff, you know, artists use it, painters use it to get straight edges when they're painting walls and stuff. And I will write what the problem is. So for instance, both of these faders and the left hand side of them, which corresponds to groups one and three respectively, work properly. The right ones don't. It's really only in the up top corner and I have to sort of push the faders like that to get them to connect. I suspect that that's just corrosion, probably, of the brushes. Um, I'll need to look at that. So this will need to be disassembled. I'll remove those faders, disassemble them, deep clean them. Hopefully that will resolve that. The play button does work, but you sometimes have to press it repeatedly and quite hard in order to work. I'm finding, let's see if I turn this on, it's cutting out sometimes. If I push, if I can reduce it, there we go. See that? And it's back again. That's a known issue. Basically, the voltage regulators are along here. So if you disturb the case and you disturb the voltage regulators, and I think it's the regulator that handles the control system, is most susceptible to that. I'll show you this. Well, play worked first time there. But yeah, it's pretty unresponsive. I've also written down, I mean, I'll do a proper calibration later, but um, what I'm noticing about the arrays, so um, it's working on all channels, but not channel three, track three, I should say, sorry. I'm getting recording on, on all eight tracks, um, but they're very varied in the level. I've got one that's actually slightly too loud, one that's correct, but all the rest of them are between minus three and minus 10 decibels, quieter than the input signal. I haven't tested playback because it's too much of a hassle. Um, this only having bus outs, I really need to fix the fader first, but I would typically have a strip here so I can make notes about any problem channels. Now, the reason I would do that, even though I'm not calibrating it properly, is see with um, Racetrack 3, you know, I've basically taken this apart, rebuilt it, and I want to get as many issues as possible on the second time I open up and disassemble it. So I can investigate, for instance, 
is there a broken cable going to the third segment of the erase head i can fix that in while i'm in there fixing this button and these faders it may be by the way that this thing where this cuts out depending where you push on it Let's see if i can get that back oh yeah it comes back again is partly because I've only got like three out of what 10 or 11 screws that hold together the two halves of the case it might be if all the screws were in there it was more stable I don't really know but I will have a look around this area and see if there's anything loose I'll come back once I've done that I'll let you know how I get on with it I've removed the two halves of the hang on how are these labeled I can't see the labelling on it. Here you can see where those two boards came from, okay? So it's these central ones that have got like group buttons and uh, the two master faders on it. So I had been assuming that there was corrosion on these two faders, but having taken them out, what I've noticed, I'm not sh sure whether this is going to show up in the camera. Can you see on this left hand pin just above my fingertip that there's a big old ring around there? If I push on this fader you can see it actually widening so that's the one i was pointing at then kind of the same thing here it's not as pronounced but i think you can probably see that there's a ring around that left one it's an actual physical break so i think what's happened is just the pressure of people when i say people the previous owner pushing on the fader has actually physically damaged the connection. So on both of these, it's the uh, right-hand channel that has got cracked. So I think I can just get away with just touching up the solder and there's nothing wrong with the fader themselves. I've now removed the control board. You can see where previously I've done some repairs to the plastics. Repaired the door in this model. There's a broken button that I've fixed, um, a couple of broken mounting post standoffs, some repair to the case. Anyway, the play problem, same thing again, I think you can see more clearly this time. There's actually, I mean if I push on it, you can make the gap wider with my fingernail. Um, but yeah, pressure on that has actually cracked the solder. So I'm not going to replace the switch, I'm just going to introduce fresh solder into that. Uh, so that there's an electrical connection and that will fix the play issue, I think. Here I am, I've got the top half of the case off. Examining the erase head problem. You can see from the numbers here. It's P302. So I can tell that that is for channel 3. We follow this orange cable over. I've untangled these wires somewhat and... Uh, so we can see here's the red and white one at the base of the 8-track erase head and they do seem to be attached if you're wondering why there's a third cable there I think this black one just it must be shielding it's going to terminate under this bit of wrap here so it's just to prevent any interference getting into that signal as it passes along this cable uh, but the red and white cable that, that connect to this base here, that will be the two halves of the circuit that's going into the little coil surrounding the magnet that's inside that segment of this head. And so one of these eight little windows at the top will correspond to that. There's a couple of things I can go and do to test that. Um, I can compare the continuity and resistance, put new point cables into that socket test it and um, see if I've got continuity meaning that the coil inside and the cables connecting to it are intact. If I don't get a continuity bleep or at least a resistance reading that corresponds to one of the healthy erase channels then I can also test here because it could be that the cable is faulty but actually the coil inside here is okay or the cable and the coil are okay but although these solder joints look okay maybe they're dry joints so I could replace the solder. If that's not it then it's probably going to be just that the erase signal is too quiet. Um, so what I can do is hook my meter up here, making sure that I'm getting the same AC voltage out of the two pins there as I am at a healthy terminal like this one. Presumably it's that variable inductor there that turns up or turns down the amplitude of the bias signal coming out and going to the erase. Say that was 0 0.5 volts AC, whereas the healthy one 0. 9 volts AC. I could turn that up to 0 0.9 volts AC 
read it on the meter with the AC meter connected to those two pins. Okay, so you hear that beeping. Uh, we do have continuity. So I'm using these alligator clips plugged into the continuity meter. Got a reading of 7.8, 7.9 ohms. Those clips are attached to little DuPont male-to-male -male cables that are going into the socket for the problem segment of the raise head. So that tells me that the coil inside that segment of the head is intact. The solder between that coil and the cable is okay and it's getting as far as here. So unless there's any damage to that socket there, then we can assume that what is going on with that raise is either the, the head's dirty, which I don't believe because I cleaned it when I was refurbishing this, or more likely just that this bias signal is quieter on this channel than it is on the other ones. So at some point, I'll probably deal with the other issues with the machine first. I will, sorry, I'll just turn off that meter, horrible sound. Um, I will trick this into thinking that it's recording that will mean that it's sending race bias through this socket. I'll measure the output of that socket and turn it up until it is as loud or even louder than the reading that I'm getting on the healthy sockets. Now that I've established that the erase head is okay, I want to check whether there's actually any bias signal coming out of the board and into the head. So you can see that I've got tracks 3 and 8 armed. Three because it's the faulty one, eight because that is a socket that's nearby. So I can compare an unhealthy track, number three doesn't erase properly, with a healthy one, it does erase properly. So when I put this into record like that, just got a blank tape in there. So I'm not recording anything in, I don't have any end pitch signal. Um, but that means that the bias signal, which does the erasing, is coming out of the erase head. The bias signal is just an 85 kilohertz sine wave. 85 kilohertz is about four times higher than the highest frequency that the human ear can hear. And the effect of putting a sine wave like that onto the tape is that it erases any audio information that was already on there. So I can go around to the sockets and test for the presence of the bias signal using the frequency counter setting on my multimeter. And then if it's present, uh, I can measure the amplitude using the AC voltmeter. Typically, I find that the bias voltage is at least 0 0.5 volts RMS. RMS stands for root mean square. It just means average. It's just one of several ways of rating how loud uh, AC signal is. So let's go around the side of the machine and have a look at that. Just to briefly show you how I've got the 488 propped open. Because of the cables connecting the two halves of the unit are pretty short and I'm just using a bit of rolled up cardboard to keep this open. I have a whole box full of these, just bits of cardboard rolled up with an elastic band around it. I find that you can sort of slot those over the mounting posts in Porter Studios and then the uh, weight of the upper part will rest on these if you get one in the right length. With the lower edge of the upper part is just resting on that edge of the case. I'm giving you a handheld angle of this. There's the cardboard propping everything up. And there's a blank tape in there. So when I'm hitting a raise, I'm not raising anything because there isn't any information on there. So right now the multimeter is in frequency counter. So it's measuring hertz. And it's got zero hertz at the moment because there's no signal coming through. If I disturb these leads, you might see some uh, ground hum coming through 50 hertz um, but you can see that I'm using alligator clips that's attached to male to male DuPont wires which is then attached to female to female DuPont wires which is attached to the header where the raise head goes in um, the leftmost I'm thinking of that as left and this is right uh, the leftmost of, of those is just shielding for the wire to stop noise or interference uh, but this pair would carry the AC signal, the bias signal. So that will settle in a second, go to zero. And then if I press record and play off the screen, you're going to see nearly exactly 85 kilohertz. Come on, come back to life. It's just turning itself off. It's a battery saving feature. 
more or less exactly 85 kilohertz come up. And if I switch this to voltage AC mode, I don't know why it's saying it's four volts, absolute bullshit. Come on. That was a ranging glitch there, but yeah, now you can see it's 0 0.54 volts RMS. So the peak voltages in the positive and the negative direction will be higher than that, but the average voltage is about 0 0.55 volts or 545 milliamps. As you saw earlier, this is track 8 that I'm plugged into. Track 3, that's the faulty one, is in this plug over here. So if I go and plug in there instead, I've got pretty much zero volts. It's probably just a you know, it's background noise or something that's reading. And if I go to, I did this off screen, this is why I know this. The frequency counter isn't picking up. So that means that the bias signal isn't getting as far as that socket. So the head's healthy, but the signal to the socket for the head segment is faulty. So I'm going to have to do some troubleshooting on this board. Uh, what that's going to involve is I do have the schematic for this model. I'll have a look at the schematic and try to identify the path that the bias signal takes from the bias oscillator to that socket. And um, I'll try and uh, make myself a sort of short list of the components through which it will pass. Then I'll be going in with, probably I'll use the oscilloscope. Actually, that's going to be an easy way to do it. Um, I can just see the sine wave at the different points and see where it stops. There's probably one or more faulty components just in that channel three segment of this board, how it transmits the bias signal to the arrays head. So I just need to find a component and replace it and uh, that will probably work. Here I am in Photoshop. I opened up one page from the service manual as a Photoshop file. The schematic is in the background, but I've put some annotation over the top of it in this sort of magenta colour. I tend to think of schematics as being a diagram of the entire London underground, but usually we're only concerned with like one line on the underground at a time. So in this case I've highlighted everything that pertains to the erase bias for one channel. So this large highlighted area here, that's the oscillator itself. We know that works because we've been tested for the presence of an 85 kilohertz signal using the multimeters frequency counter setting, but also a uh, recording wouldn't be working if this wasn't working a bit. But anyway, it comes up here. I think that's probably a switching power mute transistor, maybe driving it a bit. Here's one of four transformers. What you'll find in schematics like this is they will show the circuit once and then they'll just have these dotted areas to show you duplicates of it. So here I'm looking at transformer T151. Anyway, there's four of those and each of them corresponds to the group that you can arm. I'm not entirely sure why there's a transformer there. Um, there must be some sort of isolation issue. Maybe it's even a step up or a step down transformer It's making the AC voltage that's coming from the oscillator over here on the right of the screen larger or quieter but anyway from there it's going to a relay uh, relays usually have a k prefix and uh, they will show the box where it is in relation to other components so you can see it's got diodes around it and then they will do a kind of uh, dot 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 to the actual switches that the relay controls so these two switches here are being shut or open depending on whether the um, little electromagnet in the relay is shut or open. As so long as that relay is closed and that bias signal will be going via this little inductor, variable inductor, out to the race head. So I'm looking at channel 1 but um, if we substitute in, see that's L101, it would be L401 would be um, for channel 4, L801 would be channel 8 and so on. So quick summary, oscillator, transistor, transformer, relay, coil, head. So that's quite a short list of things to check and I actually know by deduction that the everything up to this point is working. Really I only need to test whether it's 
reaching the relay, getting past the relay, I mean, I'm, I'm suspecting there's going to be a problem with either the components of the, themselves or the solder around this relay or this coil. So that's where I will test. This is pretty much the same setup as we saw before. I was looking at this area, this variable inductor here is the inductor that we were looking at in the schematic. And this black box here is the relay. And I was thinking about, well, how do I actually access those in order to get a reading? The points I would really need to test are underneath here. This board's awkward because things like the header in the bottom left of the screen here that I'm tapping, there are pins coming from the DBX board upwards into that. There's loads of cables connected here. And it would be very difficult actually to access those points in order to make those tests. And I was beginning to wonder whether I needed to take this board out, remove those components, test them out of circuit. Uh, but then I noticed when I was showing you the difference between the output from this socket and this socket earlier, remember that I was saying that one of the three pins was just shielding for the wire and the other two carry the AC signal. Notice that the plastic tab where the header here slots into the connector is on that side on this one, but it's on this side closer to my hand on this socket. So when I plugged that in and as part of that demonstration, I had these two point wires over the wrong two pins. I had one of the pins on an AC line, but the other on the shielding for the wire. Um, so there wasn't a complete circuit. Um, so of course the, it looked like there was no AC bias. Whereas if I turn this on now, I do actually have the 85 kilohertz a little bit quiet to erase the information on the tape so it needs to be turned up slightly and it's possible that the head is a little bit dirty i'll clean it again it's possible that me not having used all the screws that keep the two halves of the case closed meant that there was improper contact between the erase head and the tape but i will turn that voltage up and when i test arrays next, I will ensure that the head has been recently cleaned, that the case is completely closed with all the screws, and hopefully that will resolve the issue. So this gives you an idea of the sort of thing that can go wrong, the way you can confuse yourself when you're assessing these things. It's good in a way because I got to show you the schematic and hopefully some of you out there who are interested in how a race works on these machines got a bit of insight from that. but. Uh, yeah, that was a red herring. I don't think there's actually any problem with how the bias is coming out of that socket after all. Hopefully now I'm past the erase issue, so I'm going to calibrate the unit at this point. You can see this is quite a well annotated board. It showed you where the level and EQ controls are for each segment, and there's a clear number beside each one. So um, that's going to be channel 2 and channel 6, channel 5, channel 1. The only thing that's slightly unusual about it is that the record levels are in two groups here and here off to the side. I've inserted this TIAC test tape. I've established in another video that this is printed right across the width of the tape so you can use it with a four track or an eight track head. Press play. Seven and eight are flickering a little bit. I was finding that channel four on the four track machine, there was a little bit of variance there. So there's just something up with the tape there, but pretty much all of them are hitting about plus three dB. That's gonna be good enough anyway. I'm coming to the end of this process now, and honestly, it's been a bit of a frustrating one. Last thing I want to draw your attention to is that the plastic case, at least on this unit, has a huge bearing on whether cording and the erase is gonna work at all and what the playback levels are going to be. And I don't know if that's because this particular unit has been stored badly. I don't know if it's because it's got spin welding it inside. I figure that the way that the tape is cradled inside this cavity, effectively this cavity is an extension of the cassette player. And uh, I didn't film it, but during the process of calibration, I got everything so the playback and recording was looking really well balanced and then I turned it back on and I wasn't getting anything from the meters in playback at all. I thought, right, is a voltage regulator detached? Have I blown a fuse somehow? Have I left a cable unplugged? Opened it, everything looked fine. I was kind of getting really frustrated. And what I realized is that the way the screws were tightened with the two halves of the case were meaning that the head in the raised position wasn't making contact with the tape at all. Now I've got it into some kind of equilibrium here 
<laughs> famous last words. And it stopped working again. Oh yeah, absolute bastard of a thing. You see how these, I mean, all I've done is set up the camera and it stopped working. I mean, I had that so all these levels were even, but you see how just like pushing on the case completely changes the way that these are responding. Like all of these were at plus three dB a minute ago. Well, I mean, at least this isn't <laughs> cutting out like it was earlier. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to make you aware that that has been... All right, we're, so we're getting back to it now. What happens if I stop and press play again? <laughs> it's all incredibly quiet again. Right, I'm probably going to have to do some more work off screen to kind of figure that out. But I mean, it is to do with flexion in the case... Yeah, now these ones are even, these four are quiet. I've tried to fix the, uh, you know, the screw adjustments around the head. I've, I've checked all that. That's not it. I mean, I've had issues before where I've been scratching my head wondering why a race isn't working properly in machines. And I, I think it is just actually the plastic case as opposed to the bias system or the race head that's causing the problem. So I just want to flag that up as the potential cause for um, a problem you may have. <laughs> So there I'm pushing the cassette up against the head and we're getting something a bit closer to what it was like when it was calibrated. Um, and the thing is, this kind of really throws the calibration off because the only way to do a calibration on this unit is to have it sort of propped open so you could access the trim pots. That's different to what I had when the case was open, just because the physical contact between the cassette and the head's different. So, yeah, be aware of that if you've got a unit with those sorts of problems. Look, I've just pressed it. And, oh, no, it has come to the end of the tape. You see, this is how paranoid it's making me now. Anyway, um, I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.